Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's coverage here at Black Hat. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage with Savannah Peterson and myself, digging into all the experts and the companies changing the game in security. A lot going on, a lot of problems being solved. A lot of things have happened in the past couple weeks to sit on the table. Trish Cagliastro is here, founder and CEO of Rev Wizards, formerly with Wiz, CUBE alumni. Great to see you. Great Th to see you, John. Thanks thank for having me on. Thanks for coming back. Well, I really wanted to chat with you because um, a couple of years ago when we were at Wiz, we were at an Amazon event and you know we kind of were riffing and then we had a separate conversation off camera around how cloud really helped and how COVID really kind of propelled this cloud security story. And now in this market, we're seeing a huge data play. Mm -hmm. We're seeing infrastructure at the silicon level getting faster. You're seeing kernel developers rise up and being more productive. All the best AI stuff is kind of getting closer to the hardware. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of changing there. And then all open source ecosystem is booming with generative AI. So generative AI has created this flashpoint where it's clear that this, is, this wave is happening. So it's an opportunity, but also a challenge for the industry. So I want to get your thoughts on that. What's your reaction to that? What's your perspective of the impact of Gen AI to security? Sure, I, I feel like it's cloud 2.0 for us. Like we have a chance to get it right this time in security. You know, when, when cloud started, we, we pushed back a little. It took us a minute to get on board. Mm -hmm. um, similar to COVID, right? Uh, Gen AI has happened. The business has decided it's happening. Now we got to figure it out. And of course there's always going to be the, when you think about how you can be successful with Gen AI, at the end of the day, it's, it's a data story, right? Which there's some obvious follow through of like naturally that means well probably a data security story. I, I always thought it was interesting when I was at AWS and I was working with customers, you know, we, we talked to them about things that we wanted to do from a security perspective in their environment. And most of the time they'd be like, I, I don't know what's in my environment. Ask customers what's in their data, where it is and who has access to it. The answer is, is a little scarier. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing I'd say too, is I think it also is an opportunity beyond the challenge side. So that's the scary side. The happy side is, is that, you know, I, I think if we, I was joking about this earlier, but if, if we went downstairs and we made it into a drinking game of which vendors have on their marketing material a reference to the security workforce shortage, uh, we probably wouldn't make it very far into the event before neither of us could stand. But what that tells us is, is that we have this huge opportunity in security to embrace it. Like let's lead the conversation on how industry should be using AI. Okay. Cost reduction, great story. Even better one is how I've taken all of these tools and been able to take my two million person workforce shortage and ultimately be able to accomplish and, ta and have the talent that I need um, instead of having that big gap. Yeah, and I think the productivity angle on that is huge. I think the, the AI opportunity is going to be, where's the data? Mm -hmm. What can I automate? Right. What's the heavy lifted, undifferentiated heavy lifted, to use the Amazon term? Two, what's going to help me do my job? How do I drive security posture and uh, uh, identification, discovery, mediation, faster. Right. That's going to be the key. I think that's true. I mean, I think about myself, and I'm, I, my friends will tell you, I'm always like the last person to adopt technology. Uh, I was like the go-to resume writer for all my friends. Let me tell you, ChatGPT is who I send them to now. I mean, even in your, your regular daily life, like there's all these opportunities to help you do things much, much faster. And that's, those are things that excite me. You got the new gig going on. You were at Wiz. Um, how long are you at Wiz for? Three years. So that was quite the ride, and big, obviously big news of the Google acquisition they turned down. Um, big success story, and I want, what I want to get your thoughts on is one, compare what Wiz did to kind of what we're seeing in the market now, because we're predicting, um, certainly Dave and I talked about this on our cube pod, and certainly the research shows it, a lot of startups going to come out of the woodwork soon, and you're seeing existing startups kind of at the crossover point where they're either going to propel. So we haven't yet seen the breakout for that next big startup. But it will come and it'll probably look like Wiz. So the, the time to market value, I mean, even if you add Gen AI, I talk about resume, but up marketing literature too. So the, going to market is different now. What are you going to see there for, and how do you look at that? Because you were you were a wizard at go to market, hence the Rev Wizard uh, name, your company. So Wiz was successful. Just a little. Uh, no, I, you know, when I think about Wiz, I think the thing that was really so unique about us is that to me, it was this convergence of, of course, amazing product, unlike anything I'd ever seen in my career, right? Beyond the product though, there's a lot of great products. There was the timing, right? There was the size and growth of the market due to COVID. There was all these things that were converging to kind of create this opportunity. And to me, if you had to say, what is the second most important thing beyond the product? It was our ability to execute. It was to be able to see those things that were going on mm -hmm. and be able to capitalize on them. So like, what does that actually mean going forward? I think that every company that starts now, if I'm a startup that's been around for a long time, I now have to execute in a way that I never did before. 
because every six months the whole tech stack is changing. I have to think about tech debt in a way that I never did before. Oh, by the way, it's also really expensive to build companies like that, right? And to be able to execute and go as quickly as you need to, it costs a lot of money. So that means valuations rise. And so I think that as we're we're getting into this yeah. this emerging market, like we're just we're just starting to see some of these these secondary impacts and, and kind of how it's gonna change how we think about everything and how we go to market. You do a lot of advising, you working with startups and big companies. As you look at the show floor at Black Hat and there's a lot of vendors, you know, shaking shaking the tree, trying to get some cash out into their pockets with the product. What is your biggest advice? Because the market's in transition. And people win in transition. This is a huge opportunity for the players in the industry. But the products are also transitioning. So you get market and product transition. What's the advice to companies? Because people are trying to figure that out. You know, I think this is one of the craziest things, but it's, it's so weird. If you, you got to listen to your customers, right? Your customers are the ones who are ultimately telling you what their priorities are and what they need. If you have a product, if you're meeting your customers' demands and, and you're meeting their requirements and you're prioritizing them, that's important. That's always the most important thing that I tell startups. The other thing I would say too is take advantage of the new technology that is out there. I think not only are you seeing new startups come out, you're seeing traditional companies or, or maybe companies that aren't as, as new take advantage of these technologies and it's a, it's a way for them to bridge that competitive gap, right? I always thought this was interesting. There's a, a big difference between being in the cloud and being cloud native. And it takes a lot of work to really truly be cloud native. It, it reminds me of that same example where companies now, if, if, if it takes me a really long time to rewrite into a cloud native application, if I start to introduce things like AI, I can build things faster. It's a really great opportunity, not only just for startups, but for big companies to really reinvent themselves in a way that, that is ultimately really beneficial to the company, to their customers. It's interesting, we're seeing a lot of companies certainly trying to deal and rationalize their portfolio with security products. There's like thousands of vendors, thousands of products. Um, and risk management is key. So integration, interoperability, those are big factors. But a lot of the the, um, the planning, thinking about the CISO and the, the executive business leaders and technical leaders is that they want to build a foundational, solid foundation for 20 years, 10 to 20 year horizon. And they're starting to have conversations that don't sound like they were before. It's complete refresh, complete rewriting. It's a systems architecture. So the whiteboards look a lot like a systems problem with data versus an analytics database problem. So you're starting to see that shift. What's your reaction to that? Because we're seeing the big companies have end-to-end -end workloads. They just don't have Gen AI yet. They will. they will. Net new applications will emerge, but that has to have a different data model. Right. Data has to be available. So the whole data scene is upside down. Data security. How do you architect that foundation in, in your mind while deploying the best security? I mean, I think I'm a big believer in you have to know where you want to go, right? So, and, and you asked, my opinion is it really excites me because I think for a really long time, we've tried to band-aid together some newer stuff with some older stuff. And it, it kind of puts us in the situation that we're in now mm -hmm. where when you want to take advantage of, where, of the latest things today, it does require kind of a, a larger organizational mm -hmm. transformation. So to me, that's really exciting. Yeah. And when you think about the data side of that, right? Yeah. Um, and if you start with this idea of, okay, I want to build this thing um, that is going to ultimately solve some problem for a customer, right? The idea is then, okay, well, let me think about, well, what kind of data do I have that is going to get me there? Like, what do I need to answer those kind of questions? Uh, what are the data sets that I, I need to go get? Because chances are, I, I might not have all the data that I need. I'll give you a funny example of this, right? Like, so my toothbrush has AI now, apparently. <laughs> uh, it was used to make, to make it more efficient, and so does my husband's golf clubs, right? Um, those are data stories, right? Where if you think about like the golf example, they're collecting data on how people use clubs, how they hit them from all these wonderful hardware sensors that are out there to track mans. And so I think that being able to understand what the types of data yeah. you are, and then what, what's in that data? Because it's one thing to say, I need this kind of data. It's a whole other thing to understand what's actually in it. So a, a good example of this is like, I think that as we think about architecting what we put in the data, being really thoughtful about not the not just the obvious like use cases of like hey like probably don't write a social security number in clear text into a file just not a great idea <laughs> uh, we're gonna have to get a little thoughtful on like well what happens when we write to a log file from the output of our applications um, not really realizing oh like we accidentally dumped the entire object and that was the the address and things for the people. So all these, I think that as we're thinking about you know, data and as a whole and we're thinking about it from a security perspective, if we think more about how people intend to use it, um, not just what we have, I think ultimately that's going to help us design more secure solutions for it. And we saw a lot of the, the breaches are a result of either misconfiguration or bad DevOps practice. We just saw the CrowdStrike, Microsoft, and now Delta's involved because they got the biggest impact. But that was a disruption. That was not a breach. 
Um, but that was failed because of humans. Maybe AI helps there, maybe it doesn't, and they would have flagged it. It's a bad process. I mean, that, that could be detected. I think a better, in my opinion, I think a better way to think about that is that we, technology integrates with our lives in a whole different way than we ever probably envisioned, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, right? And what that means is that if it's in our lives, we probably have to think differently about how we recover from it and, and have more robust planning. Like, it's, it's easy to say like, oh yeah, like and, and play Sunday morning quarterback of how to make yeah. sure that doesn't happen. It's gonna happen. Yeah. Um, I think that as an organization, having dis strong disaster recovery plans, yeah. understanding um, you know things like prod and dev environments, right? There's all these things that go into play that all of us should be doing, whether it's on the customer side, on the vendor side. Yeah. I think it's a healthy wake up call for everybody that we can always get a little bit better in how we're approaching uh, managing very high priority systems because it's it's yeah. you know and you think about it now and today where you have potentially electronics in your body and stuff like that probably want to have some good strategies about how we handle that in the real world first. Trish, what what do you see the market changing in the next year? If you if you see the progression, obviously we're in a little bit of a global meltdown this week earlier in the week, um, but now you see the startups are in that point where okay, are they going to make the money? Are they going to have the right products? Um, there's a lot going on. Where do you see the market evolving to in the security space? I, I think I, I tend to agree that there has to be some amount of consolidation. Like if I'm a CISO, I'm, I have a really tough life. I'm not happy. I keep getting told by every other vendor, no, 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 just deploy this one more thing and then you'll be good. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think they feel very good. And so at one point there, there becomes a need where you have to consolidate where you can consolidate. Yeah. I, that has to happen. I also think you're going to see new types of technology that emerge because we're going to face new types of threats. Whenever mm -hmm. we do new things, um, usually as a, as a species, we tend to figure out how to do bad stuff before we help ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we have to be prepared for those things that are going to come. You throw in things like quantum and cryptography, it gets even more complicated. And so ultimately, I think I have no idea what's happening over the next year. Uh, it's probably going to be a lot. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of things. That's that are an honest going answer. On. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, the world could spin in any different direction. Right. Um, so, what are you working on these days? So, Wiz was a great run. Congratulations Thank on you. that success. Um, nice feather in the cap there, and they continue to to, to move forward. Um, you got new things now. What are you up to, uh, Rev Wizards? Um, so right now we're helping companies go to market with the cloud providers. I think that was one of the most critical things to help us grow it was, I'm, I'm, Kevin, I'm a little bit biased in that. Yeah. Um, and you know, ultimately when I look at the market and I think you know, part of what really excited me about my role at Wiz is I felt like I was sitting at this convergence of people changing the way they consume and, and buy and, and ultimately leverage technology. That's exciting to me. So as we get into um, the future, right, yeah. what I really wanted to do is help companies take advantage uh, of the cloud providers and of the different ways that you can go to market and help accelerate it. You know, we were talking about this in our conversation yeah. earlier, and I yeah. agree. The, the execution window for startups yeah. has become smaller. That's the that's the scary side of the technology, right? And so my goal is to help my customers and the organizations I partner with to be able to take advantage of those different trends. Yeah. Speed and scale are the new, yeah. new, the new moats. You know, as you get the scale and the speed critical. It's not even the moat anymore. Now yeah. you have to build the, excava the excavator <laughs> that's always digging the moat. It's like table stakes. Yeah. Trish, great conversation. Thanks for coming by and Thanks, sharing man. your insights on the queue. Great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Awesome. Thanks for having me, John. It was great. Thank you for watching. I'm John Furrier with the Cube. We'll be back from Black Hat after this short break.